Speaking of sights, we're looking at a live shot of Miami International Airport. It appears that the Popal Mo Pope Papal motorcade, it's been a long couple of days, is now arriving at the airport, preceded by Florida Highway Patrolmen on the motorcycles there. This is a sight that has been rather common since uh, about this time yesterday. And Dwight, I should tell you that it is starting to sprinkle out here, although not uh, drastically, nothing that's going to keep any airplane uh, from leaving right now. It's an inter interesting entourage, as uh, you can probably hear the helicopters in the background. They are flying now uh, all around the airport at relatively low levels, trying to make sure that absolutely nothing broaches their security. Uh, interestingly enough, let's, let's get into exactly who is in those cars behind the pontiff uh, as he makes his way toward uh, Shepherd One. Uh, in addition to the, the Pope, there is his personal secretary who travels with him at all times, the Vatican Secretary of State, Agostino Cardinal Casaroli, the Under Secretary of State, because we have to remember that Vatican City is a self-sufficient and sovereign state. Three members of the Secretariat. There is the Papal Visit Coordinator, whom I'm sure right now is uh, pulling his hair out, trying to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible. There is the Prefect of the Papal Household. We also have the Under Secretary for the Council of Papal Affairs of the Church, the Papal Master of Ceremonies that we've heard about over the last couple of days, who is there to simply make certain that all ceremonies flow smoothly. Of course, uh, when you have uncooperative things like the weather, there's not a heck of a lot you can do about that. There is also the Director of the Vatican Press Office, the Director General of Vatican Radio, the Director of the Vatican Newspaper, of course, the Head of Security for Vatican City, a member of the Swiss Guards, four members of the Swiss Guards are here in plain clothes, the valet to the Pope, and finally, the Papal Physician. Uh, the Pontiff is also, as a medical aside, carrying his own blood supply on this trip throughout the United States and Canada because he has a relatively rare blood supply, A negative. And as a result, they have stockpiled a, a units of blood for him in the untoward incident that uh, something might happen. At any rate, there is not going there. We have an aerial view of Shepherd One, and you see the problems because we are out of shot on the right of your screen right now. The motorcade is coming in. The, there is going to be no formal ceremony bidding farewell to the Pope. Archbishop McCarthy is with him. They will simply uh, bid farewell to one another. The pontiff will board the plane, and that will be it. Next stop is Columbia, South Carolina. amazing to me that with all the myriad of details that had to be attended to uh, throughout this visit, even though he was only here for 24 hours, that in fact everything has gone very smoothly, weather notwithstanding. I think now we just ought to take a break and let the pictures speak for themselves. You might point out, Art, that uh, although the Pope is leaving South Florida, we're definitely not going to lose touch with him. Eyewitness News Washington Bureau Chief Tina Galland will be traveling with the Pope. Uh, throughout his tour of America, so we'll be bringing you periodic reports on the Pope's visits to other American cities, and perhaps we can see uh, and make some comparisons. It's going to be an interesting trip. There's, there's no question about this. Anytime a, a pontiff undertakes a, a journey such as this, 12 cities uh, in that many days, uh, in meeting with so many groups as he is, uh, there, there is an underlying cause there, and it's 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 more than just bringing the word of God to the people around the world. Art, this live shot that we're looking at now, Pope John Paul II greeting the men who have protected him during his stay in South Florida. Again, taking the time, in this case, to say thank you. This again, Dwight, was, was planned, but it's, uh, it's certainly gratifying that the members of the law enforcement agencies who are responsible for the papal security while he was here are now getting their due. Is that not due. Dade County Manager Sergio Pereira in the white shirt? Yes, I believe it is. Yes, it is. Certainly a man who has gone through more than one headache in the last six months. Airport Director Richard Judy, I saw on the line there. This is one receiving line that is definitely apolitical. talking about the security force, it was massive. 1,600 National Guardsmen on duty, 300 state agents, hundreds of Florida Highway Patrol troopers and police officers from Metro Dade County, the city of Miami, and they probably even borrowed some perhaps from other jurisdictions to make sure that everything was covered. The Pope, 
about the base of Shepherd One. He's giving a blessing to Archbishop McCarthy. They're uh, formally bidding each other goodbye. Certainly, I think Archbishop McCarthy is one of the more thankful individuals on the face of the earth today for all the planning and all the, uh, the work that has gone into this. It doesn't seem possible that it's, it's already over, that his visit is now at an end here in South Florida. Pope John Paul II giving a final farewell to South Florida. of relief perhaps from the people that were watching now that it all went as planned as much of it as we could control of course we couldn't do anything about the weather there you see shepherd one it's been painted on this twa plane which will be the domestic airline for the papal travels throughout the united states right on shepherd one shepherd two and shepherd three throughout this it's uh descending importance once the, uh, the papal entourage gets underway. Uh, the, whatever vehicle the, uh, the Pope is in is Shepherd One. There we see the papal seal. And beyond that, any other plane in descending order is pa uh, Shepherd Two, Three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, this has been a specially modified 727 just for the pontiff for his trip uh, through the United States. And there is also a uh, specially altered 747 that will meet up with them in Detroit to take him to Canada and then back to the Vatican in Vatican City. One must wonder, Art, at this point, as we look at this shot of Pope John Paul II, what he's thinking right now. Dwight, it's very noisy here. I can barely hear you. He sits there in quiet reflection. As you see, the papal entourage is being loaded onto the plane. Perhaps you're wondering, well, what happens to the Pope Mobile? I repeat some information that we offered you yesterday. There are actually two Pope Mobiles uh, here in America. Two were shipped from, from uh, Vatican City, and they're using a leapfrog system. In other words, there's already a Pope Mobile II, if you will, in place in South Carolina. And this Pope Mobile will be shipped to the third city on the tour. That way, ensuring that the Pope has the security vehicle throughout the tour. We talk about attending to details throughout trips like this, Dwight. I think it'd be interesting at some point to sit down and try and catalog all the myriad of details that had to go on right down to the last little tiny detail to just make sure that the pontiff's visit goes not only as scheduled, uh, but, but as planned, that he gets in everything he wants to do and that security and uh, simply his meeting and giving a blessing to the workers at the Catholic Center yesterday goes exactly as it's supposed to. I imagine it would fulfill several volumes. In the foreground of this shot, we see police officers and other officials gathered, congratulating each other for a job well done. I don't think there's any question about that. The, None. the None. massive planning that went into this, and apparently, and church officials congratulating police officers and other officials. Pope in a moment of quiet reflection, having completed, or is it just about to complete, the first stop of his nine-city American tour. Dwight, I know when we first arrived here at the airport, when Secret Service let us back in and we discovered that the mass had been called off, we, we all thought and talked among ourselves about what a bitter disappointment that must have been for everyone. Uh, but it's amazing how well the pontiff and the archbishops took it. And I think it's uh, very representative of the man, the Pope, that he did come back to the altar after the rains cleared off to yes. deliver a final blessing. It's just a shame. Remain. Yes, Art, it's just a shame that uh, I would think the majority of the people had uh, left the park by then. Uh, we'll be able to get more information on that later. But for those who remained, I'm sure it was something very, very special to receive that final blessing from Pope John Paul II. And as you mentioned, a mark of the man. Absolutely. Anybody that would take the time to travel throughout the crisscross pattern that he did throughout the, the uh, mass site there 
sometimes two and three times, making sure that everybody who had gone out of their way, really, to come in and greet him with the emotion that they did, in fact, got the chance to get a glimpse, however brief, uh, of the man who is their spiritual leader. Where is the Pope positioned in that airplane by, by the windows? If you are looking up at the front of the plane where the pilot, co-pilot, and navigator sit, the pontiff is immediately to the right of the entrance. He is back in what could ostensibly so be is, called... So are we looking place. at him on our close shot? Are we looking at him through that very first window as we look at this shot, Art? It's entirely possible, Dwight. Uh, I am not certain. My monitor here is not very good. Okay, we're making an attempt to zoom into that window. Perhaps from a different angle, uh, I'll be able to tell. But I thought I saw windows on both sides, uh, which would indicate to me that perhaps it's a little further down. It's possible. That the first door has been closed now. Yes, you see windows is, on yes. either side, so yes. it's not the very first one. Though the seats have been taken, uh, most of the seats have been taken out in that first class section. There are normally 16 for this trip. Uh, the papal quarters, they've left only six, and in fact, there will only be two people, uh, except under diff uh, extraordinary circumstances, flying in that section. They've also cordoned off part of it uh, for his sleeping quarters. He has a closet, and he also has a bath. One other point of, uh, of information on all of this, Dwight, is the fact that uh, on his flight up to South Carolina this afternoon, uh, the Pope is uh, going to be eating very well. He's going to have a, a, a bunch of lobster and steak. And I'm also told key lime pie, a choice of key lime pie in honor of Florida and uh, in honor of South Carolina, pecan pie for dessert. Sounds tasty. <laughs> Wouldn't mind having uh, a bit of that now myself. As we look at the TWA chartered jet that will carry Pope John Paul II from South Florida to the next stop on the papal tour of America. That's interesting. There's almost a feeling of sadness here that he's going. And we were so delighted to have him that uh, the wonderful person that he is, the joy that he brought to this community, and I, I can't help but speculate on uh, what impact that is going to have on South Florida in the coming weeks and months. That the fact that a man of this spiritual magnitude has come to this community and touched it in a very unique way that only he can uh, should have a uh, carryover effect for a good time to come. At least we can hope so. You know, Art, uh, despite everything that has happened in terms of the weather conditions changing the plans, right now the Pope is only running about 10 minutes behind the original <laughs> schedule. He was scheduled to depart Miami International at 1.30, headed for Columbia, uh, if everything had gone as planned. Well, he is leaving now, Dwight. The engines are cranking up. Shepard 1 will be pulling away here momentarily. I don't believe it'll be until then that uh, Shepard 2 and 3, the press planes, will even start their engine to get out. We have this overhead shot of Shepard 1 preparing to take off. I believe they're waiting for final clearance now to make sure there are no other aircraft anywhere in the pattern, anywhere on the runways. Traffic has been halted at the airport completely. The folks still gesturing to Catholic officials on the ground waving. It all started about 24 hours ago. It's coming to an end. But it's 24 hours, Art, that South Florida will remember for a long time to come. Just unbelievable. The, uh, the many things that occurred here, both uh, in terms of, of goodwill toward the people of South Florida, goodwill toward the Catholic Church, uh, but beyond that, the bridges that have now been established, the, uh, the, the outreach that the Pope has exercised in these 24 hours, I think that is what is going to be remembered long after he leaves.
And looking around the airport, is every, has everything come to a standstill, much like yesterday when Air Force One and Shepard One arrived? I said, I said all traffic had come to a halt. I am mistaken. I see two planes in the air right now uh, that are going. Shepard Three and Shepard Two have now started their engines. They'll be taxiing out of here relatively soon. Those planes that you see, are they taking off or landing? Uh, the planes that I mentioned are taking off. They're both airborne now. I, uh, I see one plane very far out west that's coming in. So apparently they have not closed down the entire airport, but I do believe uh, that they will be closing down uh, at least one runway here on the north side. And I'm not sure what the delay is now unless they're simply waiting for all the patterns to clear. Pope John Paul II patiently waiting. As I'm sure he's had too many times in the past. I would risk a speculation that uh, what we are looking at right now is perhaps the most patient man in the world. All right, now they are getting clearance from the ground crew to go. And Shepard One is starting its taxi. Art as Shepard One prepares to leave South Florida. Father James Fetcher joins us in our studio. Father, as Pope John Paul wraps up, his visit to South Florida, some final reflections from you. Um, it's kind of nice to uh, see him go, and I hope he's dry. And uh, I'm thinking about all of the other people who uh, uh, were so powerfully uh, moved by all of that out there, and I was. At the end of the Mass, how did you feel when, when they made the decision to, to call it up? Oh, I thought that was a good idea. I really did, because uh, it, it would have been very uncomfortable in the long haul. And the exciting thing, we were talking about of the bus coming back with the, uh, the one and only Channel 10 crew. Uh, the neat thing about it was, was that everybody had seen the Holy Father, had gotten as close uh, probably as they would have in any event. And uh, that was kind of exciting. And we all kind of felt that all things considered, it came off pretty well. So there wasn't uh, an air of disappointment there. I'm sure that everyone wanted to be there for the final blessing and for communion. That, that, that was the saddest part, but I understand that we were hearing in the bus on the way back that uh, the Pope finished the Mass in the trailer, is that correct? Well, that, that's my understanding because he Powerful. came out later after uh, words and I'm told delivered the final blessing at the altar. Well, that's, that's a very touching gesture because what that means is he wanted to say that prayer for the, the people of Miami. And I mean, whether there was two people or 100,000 people, uh, he did it and he said it and uh, that speaks a lot because he could have quit right there at that point in the Mass after his homily. Well, it appeared from the shot that we had as he was delivering his homily that he didn't want to stop, that uh, uh, the decision was made and uh, he accepted that decision. Well, and clearly the crowd didn't want him to stop. Bishops and popes are uh, subject to the, the actions of their masters of ceremonies, but uh, usually those guys uh, know what they're doing and uh, that's powerful, so. As we look at the whole thing, as we look back on what's happened Father, what's this going to mean to our community in the days, the months, the years to come? Well, that remains to be seen, and I think that's very much up to us. We have a choice. We can make this uh, kind of a, a one-shot, uh, well, he was here and all, wasn't it wonderful? Or we can really reflect on what he, we said. Um, I think he paid us some tremendous compliments while we were here. He, he recognized us as a, as a community uh, capable of dealing with culture shock, with immigration, with uh, an awful lot of things are going on, and some days the magic works, and some days it doesn't, and his message to us was keep it working, make it work. You're listening and, uh, to Father James Fetcher, the parish priest at St. Louis Catholic Church in Kenda, as we watch a live shot from Miami International Airport of Shepherd One, the plane carrying Pope John Paul II and his entourage preparing to take off. As you were saying, Father? Um, I'm glad he was here be up to us as pastors to make it work, to, 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 to hear what he was saying, uh, to get on with the business of uh, the Catholic-Jewish relations. I think I got What's the next step in that process? We've heard a lot of talk, we've heard a lot of wonderful things, particularly in terms of the work that's being done locally. Of course, you're actively involved in that work, so you're very familiar with it. But as far as a community overall, what's the next step in terms of improving Catholic-Jewish relations in, in our community? Well, I think we have to g go on with, the, with what we've been doing in a very concrete way. Um, you heard the Holy Father talk about uh, education programs, for example, in Catholic schools. 
that that was kind of a direct command. I mean, if the if the Pope says that it's desirable, um, we've got to hear the message, you know, and get on with the business of putting in curriculums for just as an example. I know in my own parish we're going to be uh, working on continuing the dialogue process that's been going on for two years. He also, um, as did Rabbi Waxman say this morning, that we've got to know people where they are in their own uh, chairs and suits, so to speak. And I don't think we know each other well enough. And the more contact we have, the better we'll get to know each other. Do you see perhaps more of what's going on in your parish with uh, neighboring synagogues going on in other parts of South Florida as well as across the nation? We've been talking all day about this unique relationship that some Jews and some Catholics share in South Florida. I fail to understand why in the rest of the country that perhaps isn't the case. Well, as I said this morning, I think that a lot of it has to do with sheer numbers. There are more of us rubbing elbows here, and it makes the problem more urgent and more critical, and I think that's a help. But does it take a lot of people to talk? We're talking about communication no, as a start. No, it, it takes a lot of people to figure out there's an irritant and then that they have to do something about it, you know? And I think, I think that, that's what the issue has been, a bit, been about, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, um, and I'm, you know, I... Well, how did you and your parishioners and uh, neighbors in the Jewish faith come to grips with this whole thing and realize that there was an irritant, realize that there were some things that you really needed to sit down and talk about? For my part, it was accidental. Uh, I was asked to participate in a, a, a public television, so I can say that, program, um, that was a, uh, a sharing of Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, and uh, all of a sudden I found myself thrown every month into a situation with uh, the rabbinical association uh, president, and they changed every year. I never did, but they changed. And in meeting uh, those different rabbis over those years, I got to know some very uh, special ones, especially Barry Tabachnikov. And um, I would say that he forced me into uh, paying attention to something that I normally just wouldn't have looked at, because I got a lot of things going on in my parish, you know? And, he, and uh, that was an exciting experience. And he and uh, some Do you people, pass that message on to, to other priests, to your fellow priests? Probably not nearly as well as I should. Um, what they all need to do is to move next door to Baron Tabachnikov, and that will solve their problem, I think. Uh, also, for uh, many years, St. Louis, prior to my going there, has been involved in an ecumenical service every year. If I can interrupt you, Father, we're watching the final approach for takeoff. Shepherd One, Pope John Paul II, departing South Florida. Well, I sure know that I can. Uh, speak for the Catholics of South Florida and for uh, that we are very grateful for the reception that this whole community has given them. That's very important to us. In addition to well and funding and the world 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 and the I think that's something all of us have had the, the feeling of that just having them around is very neat to watch him and his one-liners and his jokes and his substance, very substantive things that he was saying. Well, if the experience in Columbia, South Carolina or any of the other cities on the tour is anything like that here in South Florida, I'm sure that those communities, too, will be better off with the whole experience. An incredible shot on the right, as you see, Shepherd One clearing South Florida. Look at that. Well, Dwight, from your lips to God's ears, <laughs> may it go as well in those places. Father, I want to further discuss with you in just a moment um, some of the specific issues, and let's review some of the things that uh, occurred yesterday, particularly uh, um, in some of the messages that the Pope had to deliver. But first, let's go out to the mass site and find out what's going on out there. Eyewitness News reporter Ileana Varela is there. Ileana, what's the scene in West Dade? Dwight, you know, we had been warned over and over again to expect the unexpected from John Paul II, and sure enough, the rain had just let up. The crowds had mostly cleared out because of the rain, and John Paul II appeared again on stage and from the altar came back to thank those who had persevered. He said he wanted to come back to give them the final blessing that he could not give them when the Mass was called because of the rain. He said he could not express in words uh, the kind of admiration that he had for these people who, who literally were willing to weather the storm. Most of the people who were here, and I should say it was only a, a few hundred, were chanting to him in Spanish. And then the, apparently as a response to their chant, 
the, the Pope said uh, in Spanish, muchas gracias, and then after that gave the final blessing. Um, he disappeared shortly after that, and the motorcade came out, and the crowd went crazy because obviously this was a very, very touching uh, expression from the Pope, and they were most grateful to have him uh, come out one last time. We were uh, almost on the way out ourselves. We were talking to some people who were on the way out, we could hear some people chanting almost as if wanting an encore, but certainly we, we were sure the Pope was already out of the stadium. And then all of a sudden we heard over the loudspeaker this strong voice with the Polish accent. And for a moment we, we thought, no, it can't be. And my photographer and I looked at each other and I said, that's, that's the Pope. And uh, he said, no, he, he must be out of the stadium. And I said, no, that's the Pope. And that's when we both started running towards the altar. And as I looked to either side, dozens of people who were already on their way out started running with us. And they all gathered in front of the altar for that final blessing, a very touching moment, a very, very grateful, if uh, somewhat diminished, audience. And uh, they followed him all the way as the motorcade disappeared. And uh, I can tell you that those people who stayed are going to remember and are going to be glad that they stayed. It was very touching. And we'll be able to share more of that moment with our viewers, Ileana. I'm sorry, do I, could you repeat? We'll be able to share more of that moment with our viewers on Eyewitness News coming up at 5, 5.36, and tonight at 11. Father Fetcher, I'd like to go back to you in the few moments that we have remaining for final reflection on what's taken place in our community. I guess we've got to get away from it to see what's taking place. But I think that it's, a, as I said before, a, a powerful challenge on so many different levels for us to uh, reflect on things that are very basic. I, I was thinking to myself yesterday that one of the things that I, I was uh, very excited about was uh, all of the talk about how interruptive this was going to be to our normal routine and kind of commiserating with people that might be uh, behind a blockade and whatnot. Then I began to think about it. What we really need every once in a while is um, a real powerful interruption in our routines. Um, and you don't have to be Catholic to listen to the words of the Holy Father last night, talk about freedom and liberty and gifts that are ours as American people. I think also, too, and I had a strong sense of it this morning, that uh, the American experience and the American Catholic Church um, it's going to con contribute a lot to the whole church. There's a joke uh, among clerics that uh, says that uh, the Italians make the rules and the Americans keep them, and that we tend to be uh, uh, perhaps uh, too worried sometimes about uh, the way we respond to things, and we, we get very upset when uh, it seems like uh, somebody is um, impinging on our freedom and that sort of thing. Uh, and yet, at the same time, it was the, the American contribution of, a, of a, a Jesuit whose name was John Courtney Murray, who essentially took the whole notion of religious freedom and made it a council document. And we're living that out now, and I think we're going to continue to do it. I think for the whole community, Father Fetcher, this, this experience has been incredible and something that uh, we'll long treasure. I'd like to personally, on behalf of the staff here at uh, Eyewitness News and Channel 10, thank you. All they got to do is get me dry socks. And we'll I'm do that. Happy man. <laughs> we'll, we'll do that. Thank you for being with us throughout the papal visit and sharing your expertise and explaining to both Catholics and non-Catholics what this has all been about. It's been our pleasure to bring it to you. You're going to see a lot more tonight on Eyewitness News at 5, 5.30 and 6, and a special expanded edition of Eyewitness News tonight at 11. We'll see you at 5 o'clock.